Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here for the last uh, holotype season of this school year. And we're very happy to have uh, Kostas Skenderis, who will tell us about uh, holography for QFTs in the center. Kostas, please go ahead. OK, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to give this talk and to uh, close uh, this, uh, this season. Uh, so first, I'd like to, to say that uh, you should feel free to stop me at any point. Uh, I'd rather have discussion uh, than uh, finish all the slides. Uh, so uh, what we will do today is we'll start with some general introduction, discussing uh, what is, uh, wh why we're studying this problem. And then I will uh, spend some time discussing a uh, few things which are well known, but uh, they're often uh, not uh, not fully understood. So I've seen uh, kind of a lot of uh, uh, incorrect statements in the literature and uh, a lot of subtleties and, and pitfalls when it comes to discussions of what is the boundary of ADS. So I will uh, spend some time discussing this a bit uh, slowly from an elementary perspective. Uh, and uh, this is going to lead us to the main part, which is how to have holographic setup where one discusses quantum field theory in a fixed disciplinary background by studying gravity in ADS. Uh, that would be bulk of the talk. And then uh, we'll discuss a toy model that uh, has some of the features we see in, in the bulk. Uh, that would be this the quantum field theory, namely three fermions in the sitter, and then we will conclude. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. So why studying fields in the sitter. I think it's undisputable that this is a very important topic. Uh, it has been studied through the years, but I think there's still a lot of things that are not understood. First of all, observations suggest that uh, we live in a universe with a positive cosmological constant. And as such, our universe is uh, asymptotically the sitter. So we need to understand uh, field theory in the sitter because that's the universe we live in. We also believe that the very early universe under one period of exponential expansion, the so-called inflationary period, and in that period, the, um, the description of the universe was uh, in terms of uh, quasi space spacetime. Uh, in particular, if we're discussing slow roll inflation, many of the cosmological observables, uh, which is what is, which are measured by by satellites, oops. Um, they are very well approximated by quantum field theory in a fixed sitter background. And this is historically the context where the sitter was mostly studied in, uh, you know, back, back in the 80s. Uh, so we really need to understand how quantum fields behave in the sitter. Now, a weekly couple of quantum field theories in a fixed sitter background has a very long history. It goes back to the, uh, I would say, the first few papers was uh, beginning of 70s. And then uh, after uh, inflation in, in, in the 80s, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of works. Um, and it is well now, which goes all the way to today. And it was well known that uh, when we have light fields where the mass is much, much less than uh, the, uh, the Hubble constant, that the theorists exhibit infrared divergences at loop order. Uh, I think this was known even before the paper I quote here, where Starobinsky in 84, it was already known in the late 70s. Uh, and uh, the meaning and implications of this infrared divergences is still debated. Uh, the different camps, so the one that says uh, they're important and uh, they have important physics, uh, different camps that says that they have no observable uh, uh, effects. Uh, and there are people like Polyakov uh, that uh, suggest that all of this uh, imply that uh, the sitter itself is unstable. Uh, and of course, this, this mixes with uh, the fact that uh, we, we still do not have reliable models for the sitter coming from string theory. So we don't know whether the space time uh, as such exists uh, at the quantum level. So this is still a topic with, uh, which is still has a lot of things that we need to understand. A lot of, uh, uh, there's lots of uh, subtleties and, 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 uh, and, and uh, a lot of things that we still need to understand. 
So in this work, we aim to discuss the opposite regime to go to kind of strongly couple kind of field theories in, uh, and try to understand, to understand them uh, use, using holography. So I should contrast this uh, before I do this. So this talk is, is, is based on a paper that I wrote with uh, Jose Manuel Pinin and Ben Withers, which I believe are in the audience and uh, uh, appeared uh, a couple of months ago. And, uh, and, and we also have ongoing work. And there's also important earlier work from Alex uh, Buchel, uh, which uh, I, I will refer to as we move on. Um, I think it is important to distinguish this work from uh, so-called holographic cosmology because it is conceptually different. So holographic cosmology or its precursor, the so-called the city CFT, has a different name. And then in, in that context, the, the city is the bulk. So we're trying to discuss um, a kind of the city universe with dynamical gravity using a two-dimensional quantum field theory or in the case of the sitter cofamophility with no gravity. And then uh, in, in that context, it's kind of the quantum field theory that which is not in the sitter, which describes holographically uh, the city universe. Well, here we want to use holography in the kind of the more kind of traditional perspective where we have strongly coupled quantum field theory on the boundary of under the sitter. Okay, so that's the introduction. So any uh, comments or questions based on this general introductory comments? Okay, so what we'll do next is we'll try to understand the concept of conformal boundary for uh, splitting the ADS space times. Actually, this, this concept is, is more general from ADS, it's just the, the, the general concept of conformal boundary. And there are some uh, very common misconceptions about the conformal boundary of uh, ADS, and I'm gonna start with those. So what you one often sees in the literature is the following statement. If you write, then people assume that if you write the metric in the form I indicate over here, so there is kind of an one over R square hole and some metric, then people say, once you manage this, then you say the boundary is at Z equal to zero, and this is the boundary metric. So in general, that statement is not correct. It is not correct because once you write it in this format, the R equal constant slices may be compact. And actually in many cases where people do this, they do have non-compact slices. And this means that either at some finite value of R, there is a piece of the boundary. So the boundary is not really only, sorry, this should have been R here. Uh, R equal to zero. So the boundary is not located just at R equal to zero, but has a piece located for any R. So in order to understand what is the conformal boundary, you really have to work with coordinates where the boundary coordinates are compact. So, okay, so here is the correct statement. So what is correct is that if we bring this metric in this form as in the previous slide, and in addition, the R equal constant slices are compact. But then in that case, the boundary is a bit at R equal to zero. And G naught is not the boundary metric, is the representative of the boundary conformal structure. And uh, th 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 there is a difference between a metric and conformal structure, which I will discuss in a minute. And I do want to emphasize as well that conformal boundary does not depend on which coordinates one is using. So often people would write ABS in different coordinates, and we will do this as well and as, as we move on. But using different coordinates does not, the, the, the notion of conformal boundary is coordinate independent, does not change the, the boundary, just redistributes, gives a different representation of the boundary. But if you take it account all possible components, then you end up exactly with the same. With, with the same boundary. So let me exemplify this just with the case of ADS, because this is also what we're going to use later on. I will start with ADS in global coordinates, given up here. So here, this radial coordinate goes between 0 and pi over 2. 
r equal to zero is the conformal boundary in this case. And here the r, r bar constant slices are compact. Okay, so here this is a d minus one sphere. And uh, this is the time coordinate. Now, what we usually call ADS in most of the physics literature is the universal cover of ADS. The time variable in ADS is really compact, goes between minus pi and pi. And then you, we go to the universal cover where you kind of unwrap the time direction to get the, uh, the, the non-compact time direction. So now in this coordinates, both uh, you know, T and the sphere are all compact coordinates. So for any constant R, the slice is, is compact, is actually uh, the Einstein universe. So R here represents time, which again, uh, if we take ADS, strict, strict ADS, it is, it, it is an S1. And S D minus one is, is this part over there. Now, if you look at this, this metric, and if you look at R going to zero, Okay, this metric that this does not it does not have uh, a boundary metric because the metric diverges in that limit. It has a certain order pole. There's no reduced metric. So usually, with, if you have uh, some metric and um, you look at some uh, submanifold, you can compute the reduced metric on the submanifold. In, uh, but now in this case, there's no reduced metric on the boundary precisely because you have the divergence. However, there is a well-defined conformal structure, namely a metric up to conformal transformation as I will now just review. Now to obtain a boundary metric, there is uh, a well-defined procedure, which is well known in, in mathematics. One starts by using a so-called defining function. And defining function is a function which is positive in the interior of the manifold. It has the sequel to zero at the boundary. And then what we do is we start with the bulk metric. We multiply with this defining function squared. And then you take the limit r going to zero. So in this case, this limit exists. So previously, this metric did not have a limit because of the divergence. But now we just multiply it to something as uh, a zero, a zero square, and therefore you cancel the, uh, the divergence with the zero, and therefore the limit exists. However, uh, this limit is not unique because instead of considering this omega, you can consider any other omega multiplied by another function which is non zero, which you can represent as an exponential. And then uh, if you do this, if you follow the same procedure, then you find a new metric, which is this one. Therefore, the thing which is invariant, which is invariantly defined under this procedure, is a conformal class, a metric up to conformal up to evolved transformation. Now in ADS, in this, in, in the format I gave here, I can just pick this to be my defining function. And then if I do this and take the limit, then we find that G naught is precisely the um, is precisely the Einstein universe. So this metric here is conformally flat, and this is the invariant characteristic of the space-time, which is asymptotically ADS, or ADS has a flat conformal structure, flat conformal structure at infinity. So you could use the Einstein universe as a representative, or you can use any other conformally flat metric. And usually what you see in the literature is people, for instance, using some of the other ones, and usually different choices, actually not usually, always different choices are related to each other by coordinate transformations, that's in a general theorem. So let's go and discuss this. So uh, what is, you know, different representatives of the conformal structure? Now, if you are in all dimensional ideas, there are some additional uh, subtleties associated with the holographic performance anomaly, which I'm not going to discuss here, in part because we're going to, most of the talk will be in an even dimensional idea space time. Uh, but to modulo this issue, any representative is as good and yields exactly the same physics. 
One can change representatives by doing a multi-thematism, and it's one now how to do this complete generality, not just for ADS. So here I'm reviewing this for ADS, but you can do this for any asymptotically locally ADS space time. So if you want to choose as your representative just the Minkowski metric, which is obviously conformally flat, then okay, usually we call that we say we use Wangarek coordinates. Uh, you can use uh, put the ADS metric on the boundary. Then uh, this comes by using uh, the ADS slicing of ADS. You can put the Sita metric, and that comes from using the Sita slicing of ADS. And I will review that uh, in the next slide or two, since this is going to be important. Or you can put, uh, if you wish, an FRW metric, which is also conformally flat. And this slicing has been worked out recently by by, by Yataganas and Tetradis in, in, in a series of papers. So any of these choices in absence of doing anything else gives exactly the same physics, nothing's gonna change. So in all cases, by just choosing this coordinates just does, does not change the fact that the boundary of ADS is the Einstein universe, just changes the representation of it. This is where is the boundary exactly in this coordinates what can you find the boundary? You would see it. I will discuss it in more detail in the case. Of, in this case, in the next in, in the next few slides. Now, if we have a conformal field theory, as we have usually in ADS CFT, now CFTs are invariant under wild transformations, again modular conformal anomalies. So, as far as ADS CFT is concerned, it doesn't matter which representative one is using because they're all equivalent. Um, there is a bit of a footnote here as well, because you may choose to use different boundary conditions for the fields of the quantum field theory. For instance, if you're discussing quantum field theory in Minkowski space, then usually when we do quantum, quantum field theory 101, we, what we discuss is the fields can fall off fast, fast enough at infinity in Minkowski, and that's the boundary condition we are using. But if you would want to do the sequence field theory on the Einstein universe, of course, these are not the boundary conditions we're using, because this would mean that you choose all of all the fields to vanish, let's say, the North Pole of the sphere in the Einstein universe. So quite often, what people attribute to kind of doing ADS if in Poincaré coordinates or versus global coordinates. There are differences, but the differences is not because of the coordinates, but rather because of the boundary conditions, which are implicitly assumed for the uh, for the quantum field theory on the boundary. Okay. Questions. Okay. So now, uh, now let me move to discuss uh, to illustrate this by discussing the uh, the Sita slicing of ADS. Uh, so this slide here is actually uh, to in general dimension, but here I just give it in uh, for ADS4 because um, I'm going to use it in ADS4. So then the Sita slicing is given by that expression. So this metric here is a Sita3 metric, and you can choose whatever coordinates you want for the Sita3. In most of the talk, we will use uh, either this kind of inflationary patch coordinates or the ones with conformal time. So eta here is conformal time. I need to take values from minus infinity to zero. So that's the usual coordinates people use, uh, let's say when you do inflationary physics. Now, to understand all of these issues, let's kind of map between here to any of the other coordinates. So there is a coordinate transformation even here that maps this metric in this Sita slicing to Poincaré coordinates given here, and then we can do a further transformation now given over there that maps this to global coordinates we had over there. And then by following the maps, you can see precisely which portion of your space line this coordinates match and, and uh, what you're describing. So let's uh, discuss this in a bit more of detail. So here is now the boundary. So this figure here is just the boundary. So this is R cross S2. So this is the time coordinate. This is the, uh, the, the theta coordinate of the sphere going from uh, minus pi to pi. 
and then we have an additional phi, so this uh, this phi here, which is implicit. So there is a, uh, there is an S one everywhere. So the the, uh, the azimuthal angle is, is is suppressed. Now geometries which are conformally flat can always be conformally embedded in the portion of the Einstein universe. And uh, for the CT3, that, that embedding is given over here. So the, so the, the CT3 is this kind of blue part, if you write it, global coordinates. And is this shaded part, if we're just using uh, this, if this inflationary part. So this would be, this part here would be eta equals minus infinity, that would be eta equal to zero. And uh, again, if you take tau to be periodic, then this part would be identified with that one. And then, so this covers sort of half of the uh, Einstein universe. The other half is, is, is obtained uh, in kind of a different, so there is a coordinate. So if we, again, this is global coordinates here. And there are two different ways to go to the boundary. So the boundary is at r bar equal to zero. And if you go to r bar equal to zero, either with positive t or negative t. So this is this y coordinate. And I will show you the bulk Penrose diagram in the next slide. So this part here, where we have our kind of the sitter the sitter part is the part where y goes to minus infinity. And then this other white part, this is the other half of the boundary, is when you arrive at the boundary from positive t. Okay, so that's how the boundary looks like. Now let's look how the, the bulk looks. So this is the, this is the bulk. So now this part over here is all of all of that. So this is the boundary. So here, at each point, we're suppressing a sphere. So at each point, there is a sphere, and the sphere uh, shrinks to zero size in this uh, in this dotted uh, uh, dotted line. And now these lines here are constant y lines. So y equal to zero is here. And then if this is y minus infinity, and here is y plus infinity. So these are y negative, zero, and then positive. And uh, okay, this is a Penrose diagram. So this this kind of uh, forty five degrees lines are uh, on, on all surfaces. So this green shaded region is uh, the uh, the development of the data described here, assuming nothing comes in from from uh, from this horizon inside the, inside this region. So if you would, in a sense, do it naively, you would describe only kind of this part, but clearly without doing anything else, if you're just changing coordinates, you just haven't, uh, haven't changed the physics, just describe since it's a portion of the physics of the model. You, you need to do something on top of just changing coordinates because the right coordinates gives you the right variables to do the physics one is interested in, and that's why I have been describing this because this is going to be an integral part of what I will describe next, how to go about to actually describe common field theory in the city rather than uh, in the Einstein universe. Okay, so any questions on this part? Okay, so now next, now we're going to use uh, what we learn about uh, you know, different coordinate system in ADS to actually study quantum theories in the sitter rather than the thing we're doing it, actually doing it. Okay, so as I said a few minutes ago, conformal field theory is one invariant, so it is the same in all conformally related space times. So if you want to discuss something that really makes a difference. It shouldn't be quantum field theory. So we need to deform the form of field theory by dimensional parameters. In this case, we will deform it by mass term. Or more generally, we're gonna deform the CFT by 
an operator, which is dimension, which is different than the dimension of the space time. So this parameter here is, uh, has mass dimension. It will turn out that uh, it would actually be, you can interpret this as a mass time as, as you will see later on. So since now this parameter is dimensionful, now we have broken performance symmetry. So this means that uh, you don't have any longer an equivalence to the vacuum QFT on Minkowski space under ball transformations. Of course, one can still do the same game and do a ball transformation, but now the equivalence would be between a massive theory in the sitter and a theory in Minkowski space that has a space-like defect. And with that, I mean that uh, the deformation would be singular. So, if, so if, you, if you do the, the transformations I would describe earlier, so if I start, so this is a CFT in the sitter, and then I do the transformation to Minkowski, I kind of reverse the steps. And then uh, what happens is you generate this one over eta term here. So the, 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 the this, this defect sits precisely at, at equal to zero, kind of the end of the, the, future, the future boundary of the sitter. So there are two different, you know, you either choose to study this theory or you can choose to study the uh, quantum field theory in the sitter. And these are two, two equivalent descriptions. Okay, so if this is what you want to do. So we want to start from the CFT and deform it. Okay, this is something that we know very well how to do from the very early days of ADA CFT, because this is exactly the, the idea about how to describe holographic RG flow starting from a CFT. So what you need to do is you need to turn on a scalar, which is due to the operator you deform, this one. And then you need to look for uh, asymptotically ADS domain walls of this type here. So here I have, this is an uh, this sitter sliced ADS. So this domain wall preserves the sitter isometry, the sitter three isometries throughout. Um, and uh, so this, uh, and so everything just depends on the bulk radial direction Z, but it doesn't depend on the sitter three. So it's, again, we have manifest the sitter three invariance. And what you need in order to engineer this type of theory, you need the metric, this factor here to be such that as you go to infinity, you obtain the ADS metric in ADS, sorry, this should have been the sitter sliced. Um, in the sitter sliced coordinates. And uh, the scalar field as you go to infinity it should behave like a source. This, this is the behavior of the source. If delta is, if D is a space-time dimension and delta is the dimension of the operator O. So that's what we need. Okay, so that's the general, uh, the general setup. Now, if you want to implement this in a concrete model, this is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna follow uh, uh, the, the, the work of Alex Buchel where he, use specifically this, this action. So you start from a yes, and you add a massive, um, a free massive scalar field. And with this specific mass, this corresponds to an operator of dimension two. And now what we want is we want to obtain a solution of this system. And this is something that Alex had already obtained in his paper. and. That's why we actually focus on specifically that setup because we already knew that this can be done. Uh, and this is, and then we solve the equations of motion perturbatively in this mass parameter M. And this is the answer up to this disorder. So now if you wanna check, so previously I told you the requirement is that uh, this, the metric, should approach ADS in this slice coordinates. And that precise select factor here is exactly what we had, uh, what was it, over here. So that's exactly the same factor. And then uh, we also want the scalar phi to 
approach M in this rate. So we are, we are in D equals three of uh, delta equals two. So this should be approached as e to the Z. And then you can see from here that that's precisely the rate with which this approach is infinity. And then you can work out the corrections perturbatively. Okay, so that's the solution. Now let's try to understand our global properties of the solution. Now it turns out one can uh, transform this. So this solution was given again in uh, this the set of coordinates. But to understand the global structure, we need to go back to global coordinates. It turns out one can describe this, exactly the same solution in the form indicated over here. So this blue part is, is ADS in global coordinates, exactly what I had earlier. So the only difference in the geometry is, is in this conformal factor and the, and the scalar field phi, which again can be worked out perturbatively in M. And you can see, so, so if I set M equal to zero from, from this expression here, so all of these terms are going away and this becomes ADS in global coordinates and similarly there. And you can also see, so earlier I told you when I was describing the setup here, that uh, this has a singularity at, at the, uh, eta equal to zero. So that corresponds to singularity along the, uh, the null surface y equal to one, and you can see it from over here. So this, this is a singular at y equal to one. Now, since the geometry is conformal to global ADS, this means it's very easy to understand it in the global structure and to contrast with what I described earlier about uh, ADS in the sitter slice coordinates. And that's what I have over here. So over here on the left is precisely the, the thing we discussed earlier. Now, in addition here, so we saw that uh, there is the, the space-like effect over here, and that induces singularity. So if you look at it just to leaning order, it induces a singularity along this now line over there. So once you put the defect, this clear difference between the original case where the boundary was all of this with a new case where you now have a singularity in the bulk. So it's like in the case of BTZ where you excise part of the space time to get a black hole. Here again, we excise the part of the space time behind the, uh, the, the singularity. Actually, in the deformation, the, the discussion is you do not excise this part, you excise in a sense this part over there. Um, but let, let, let me now describe what happens when m is different than zero. When m is different than zero, this line over here splits into a space like and a time like part. And this is the part that, 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 that we keep. So now let me describe a little bit the location of the singularity. Okay, so first you can compute it perturbatively because we know the geometry. And uh, then the location of the singularity perturbatively is given by this expression, which in this figure is described by this linear line over there. So this is the horizontal axis, it's M over H, and the vertical axis is the location of the singularity. Uh, at finite time, we can obtain the position of the singularity by using uh, by uh, shooting method. So we start from here and then we impose regularity as we cross this line. And uh, that fixes completely the position of this line over there. And uh, this is what one gets by, from the numerics. So you see that it actually would be interesting to understand uh, this aesthetics. Maybe this can be understood analytic. It's kind of interesting that it settles down to an, an almost, uh, uh, it becomes almost constant as m over h go to infinity. Okay, so that's now the geometry. So now that we have the geometry, now we can start analyzing the physics of the problem. And the physics of the problem, so now we have, we know for sure, we, I mean, we have a problem where it is really a quantum field theory a massive quantum field theory on the city background, which is realized holographically. And then uh, we can use holography to understand the physics of the model. 
So you can, uh, the, the physics of the model is encoded in, in correlators and uh, one can extract those using standard methods uh, using as usual uh, holographic minimization. So let's start from one point functions. First of all, the structure of one point functions is the overall structure is already dictated by the Sitter invariance plus water identities to be of the form even over here. So let's start from that one. So uh, this has two indices and by the Sitter invariance, the only thing that the can appear on the right hand side is just a metric. So it has to be proportional to the metric. Now from, um, from dimension on dimensional grounds, this is dimension three. So this explains that factor here. This is a uh, three level analysis in the bulk. That's, that's why we have the one over the kappa square, which comes from the overall action. And uh, I will explain this in a minute. So now let's move to that one. So now again, we have the expectation value of a scalar operator. It has dimension two. Therefore, uh, it has to go like h squared, the one over two kappa square, again, comes from the normalization of the action. And the fact that we have the same f here and there, and this factor here just comes from the functionality of water identities. So the, what is left in the problem is really to find this function. So for small m over h, I mean, we already know the solution. You just look at the, uh, go again, change coordinates again to go to fifth Magellan coordinates and extract the, uh, and extract the, uh, the expectation values from the asymptotics. And this, this is the answer. And, um, As m over h go to infinity, then the form has to, to become this one. And the reason is the following. So as m goes to infinity, so m now becomes uh, the dominant scale. So if m is much, much larger than h, this is the dominant scale. So this operator has dimension two. So this means that in that limit, so as, um, M is much, much larger than H, then M should be, it's the only scale on the problem. So it has to go like N square, just in dimensional grounds. And um, this fixes this form because then you have to cancel this, this factor. So what is left, this is the dynamics only determine that coefficient over there. And that's how that coefficient is minus 0.37. And this was determined numerically. So here, this in this graph, we have a log log graph uh, where in the horizontal action, on the horizontal axis we have the log m over h. On the vertical axis we have this the function f. This uh, part here is perturbation theory. Then you can compute again using Einstein equations. You can solve the asymptotics for a large m. This gives this line here. And then the dots, the black dots are numerics. So you can see the, 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 the numerics and we match very well with expected uh, uh, asymptotic behavior in the two ends. And that's how we got into uh, this, this factor of minus 0 0.37. I mean, it should be possible actually to, well, we, we, we tried to get, to get it analytically, but okay, we didn't get it, but it looks like um, it, it should be something that one could possibly extract analytically also from, uh, from the data. Okay, so now that's the physics of the one-point functions. Now next to two-point functions. So this can be computed using the methodology developed again for, for my holographic IG flaws almost, well, more than 10 years ago. It is the same steps, but it is quite technical. So uh, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm just gonna give you the overall steps and then describe the results. So to do two-point functions, what you need is you need to solve linearized equations around the background. So if you want to solve this a three-point function, then you need second order perturbation around the background and so on. So we start, uh, from uh, the linear perturbation. So we perturb the metric in domain wall coordinates. 
with the linear perturbation scalar field as well. And then once we have this, now we need to utilize the underlying symmetry of the problem. In this case is the C3 symmetry. So then we decompose these fluctuations in C3 variables in a covariant fashion. For instance, if you have the metric, this is gonna have uh, a transverse traceless part. You will have a vector part and then uh, a longitudinal part and a trace piece and so on. Now, of course, uh, this decomposition is not unique because you can do, you can change coordinates. And then as you change coordinates, this is gonna mix the different modes together. And uh, there are two ways to deal with this. One way is to think, pick a gauge and work in a specific gauge. And another way is uh, to use gauge invariant variables. Then uh, you can work in any gauge. So here we're gonna kind of work in a bit of a hybrid. So we want, we know we want to be in a fathomagram gauge because that's how we're gonna extract the correlators. So you're gonna partly fix the gauge uh, by, by going to fathomagram and that fixes this functions X, V and VM to be equal to zero. So that's zero, this zero and that's zero. So essentially you, you set to zero all perturbations that involve a like along the radial direction. And then for the rest, we use uh, gauge environment variables. Now, uh, furthermore, so if you're in, in uh, suppose you solve this problem in the cost space, which is the case where instance, people usually done this in the past, then usually at that stage, you would uh, Fourier transform to utilize the fact that there are isometries along the uh, Minkowski directions. Because now we're in, uh, in the sitter, so the isometers behave in a different way. And uh, so we need to use different variables that just use the, the sitter invariants. Uh, and since we're gonna, uh, we will be working on this inflationary coordinates, so this tilt to flat coordinates, so the, the, for those, we will free a transform. Use again uh, the, the momentum along the flood, uh, along the, the spatial directions. But of course, now the, the, the time direction you cannot Fourier transform because it's not an isometry. So for that, we're going to, uh, we, we can, we're use the, 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 the following. So if we're in the city three, then you can decompose the fields into eigenvalues of the Laplacian on the sitter. And these are just decimal functions. So then if you have this, this general field phi, this can be decomposed into, again, we have uh, kind of the, the, the exponential with, with K. And then in terms, instead of having, so usually in flat space, this part here would be e to the I omega T, sorry, omega. This would have been into the high omega e type. This would be flat. But now in uh, in the sitter, this just becomes a Bessel function. So there are two Bessels, the kind of a j and a y. One of them is regular, the other is singular, and we choose the the, the regular because you want the perturbation. So usually the rule of computing correlators is you choose boundary conditions at infinity. And then you impose singularity in the interior and that uniquely fixes your solution. So that's why we need to pick the regular solution. And now this the solution, this, this, this regular solution is uh, described by Bessel of an index nu, where the index nu is related to the eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the sitter. So now after we do this, then, okay, we in a sense solve the dynamics in two variables. What is left is to determine this radial function. So the, the entire problem boils to solving the, the radial equation and imposing the boundary conditions I just described. Namely, you, 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 want, you don't want to return on the source and, and uh, you want to have regularity in the interior. And that's how, okay, then it, 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 it is a quite involved computation, but it is uh, an, a doable computation. So now I'm gonna just describe the answer. So like in the case of, 
So if you have gravity, so if you have just gravity, then the mass for gravity is uh, just the two polarizations of the gravitons. So you have a transverse traceless mode. If you have gravity coupled with scalar, then you expect the transverse traceless mode and the scalar mode. And that's exactly what we see here. So we have, we have the tensors, which come from the transverse traceless mode. And uh, these have a decomposition similar to the one over here. So here, this was schematic for a scalar. Now, if you have an object that contains indices, okay, this is the right decomposition. And then, uh, so this HI is, is a polarization vector. And um, then what is left is to determine this scalar factor. That's, again, that's the same also, if you would do the same problem with uh, kind of flat coordinates at the end, the transverse traces mode, uh, you know, boils down, roughly speaking, to an equation for a massless scalar. And that's the equation that needs to be solved, where P is the, the function that I'm in the background and lambda is the Ankin value. And then after you solve this, then you need to look at the asymptotics and extract the right coefficient using uh, holographic minimization. And then the answer then translates into the two-point function of the energy momentum tensor. So that we already just, we are looking at uh, the transverse traces mode. So we need the projector operator to take into account that. And then we have uh, a form factor that uh, takes care of the dependence. Now, usually, kind of in uh, these variables here would be either the space variables or momentum variables. Now we are expressing things in terms of the indices. Oh, I see that over here. Uh, not okay here. The indices uh, of the Bessel and the momenta K. And um, yeah, I should have had here, let me write it. This delta new one, new two, and then delta. So we have uh, a momentum conserving delta function, and the indices uh, should match. And then uh, the answer takes the form indicated over here. Now notice that this contains the, the, the structure of this contains a polynomial new, and then contains poles. So this is a first order pole, and then here we have a second order pole and so on. Now it turns out one can rewrite this by resumming in a very suggestive form, which is given over here. So you still have the polynomial, but all high order poles disappear. So this is a sum over a single poles. And the positions of the poles have exactly conspired to produce the, the normalizable modes on that background. So this, this the, the positions of the normalizable modes are in general have the form over here. So the position is given by an integer. In this case, starts from two, three, four, and so on. And there are corrections because of the mass. Here you can see the first one, two, so we have start with a two and then we have corrections. Now let's for a moment ignore the corrections. So this, the fact that we have this, this integer, um, this, 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 this integer here, this, this is just the normalizable amounts of under the sitter. And the corrections come because we have the form under the sitter. So this, this is the leading behavior, the CFT behavior. And that's the correction because we deform away from the CFT. Um, and then uh, one has computable, uh, so then the, the residues are also computable. So this, the, the form of the two-point function has kind of a spectral form. There is a leaning piece, which is a CFT. And then there is, there are splitting pieces, but the, and then there are pole pieces, which, uh, which have the information about the spectrum of the theory. So there are poles in the, in the spectrum of the theory. And uh, this piece here is also related to what the identity is, comes because we have a non-zero expectation value in the background. So this is about the, uh, the, the tensor modes. 
Now for the scalars, the analysis is a little bit more complicated because there are a lot of scalar nodes in the, in the perturbations and uh, all of this mixed together. So that's why it is very important to form this gauge invariant combinations. Otherwise the, the computation becomes uh, very difficult. So there are three different <clears throat> gauge invariant combinations one can form this is zeta, phi and nu. So this zeta is, uh, is the same uh, perturbation that appears in uh, kind of inflationary dynamics. This is the scalar mode in, uh, in, in inflation. And then, uh, so we have these three modes and then you need to solve the bulk equations. The, th the three equations that come from uh, the constraint, the equations that come from the Hamiltonian remember, momentum constraint that relate uh, two of these in terms of the other one, for instance, you can just use one of the scalars as independent. And there is one equation that you need to solve, uh, which can be either the equation for zeta or any of the other ones. So if we found convenient to solve the equation for this phi hat. So then you have this equation here. Now this equation again, and it will be solved perturbatively, perturbatively in M. So now we solve this equation perturbatively in M, we look at the asymptotics, well, we pick the regular solution in the interior, then we look at the asymptotics, and then uh, from the asymptotics, we obtain the correlator. And uh, this is the form of the correlator. Again, there is a, a momentum conserving delta function for the two momenta. Then there is a delta function for the indices, and there is a scalar form factor. And like in the case of uh, the, um, the tensors, again, in general, in the beginning, you have uh, high order pulse, but all of these high order pulse can be removed by resummation. And the answer takes the form indicated over here. We have the leading piece that comes from the CFT, and I will discuss this also in a minute. And then you have a sum over pulse where the sum is over all normalizable modes. And the normalizable modes, again, take the form indicated over here. And uh, I think these ones were also computed first in Alex's paper in 2017. Uh, and the schematic form is again the same. So you have, you start with an integer and you have corrections, which you can compute systematically. And then uh, you have a computable residues, which again, we computed. Okay, so um, yeah, before I move on, any questions on the results and I will then make a comment about this. Yeah, so I've got a question. Um, so how much do we know uh, non perturbative in, in M? So, so basically what you showed is per, 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 calculation perturbatively in M and that you can also then basically uh, reformulate it in terms of just single poles, but could we also do it solving it numer uh, numerically then non perturbatively in M. And is also this resummation then possible? Yeah, I think for the correlators, uh, we haven't done it non perturbatively. I presume it's still possible to do something uh, numerically, but it's not gonna be easy because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult equations. It's a complicated system of equations. Um, uh, so you did it. it would be very, very interesting. Yeah. Costas, I did it. You mean uh, you, you have? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So, so if you look in my papers, the ones that you keep citing, so there are plots for the what I call uh, quasi-normal modes. I mean, for this, right? For that, that yeah, maybe yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. For for you know uh, non-linear in M. So, so given that I, you know, interrupted you, I apologize, but I have a question regarding to this. So one of the quasi-normal modes uh, that, I, uh, 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 that I had, so, so all of the ones that uh, you're mentioning are purely dissipative, so they don't have real, uh, real part. Uh, however, um, uh, there is one. Uh, there is one that has also an imaginary part. So I yeah, it's this 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 one. Yeah, this this. Uh... Oh, okay, so you have it. Okay, it's just it's just you use a little bit different notation that it wasn't clear. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean the, 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 for this, I think for the uh, for the position of the normalizable modes, that I agree that uh, can be done. I think doing the full uh, two point function that that's the part which. 
I think we, it would be interesting to be tried, but okay, it's uh, so far we managed to solve this perturbatively in M. So it's this equation that now needs to be solved uh, non perturbatively. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't see an a priori reason except for the, the fact that it's a complicated equation. Uh, otherwise, I think VI is interesting. So, Okay, so next, I think I have a comment about uh, this this form of the two point functions. Now, if you notice here, all of these other terms, all of them are proportional to M. So if we just set M equal to zero and go back to the CFT, we get that uh, the CFT correlator is now takes this form where new one is the index of the Bessel function. And again, K is the momentum. And that's remarkably simple. That's the simplest form of CFT correlators I've ever encountered. First of all, okay, you can see the left hand side depends on, the, the, the left hand side depends on K, but the right hand side only depends on K through momentum conservation. And the whole correlator is just a constant. Uh, it's just this, this, uh, this, this, this index. So usually in, in the usual forms, like in position space, of course, has the usual form one, one over X squared to the two delta. If you write it in momentum space, where we have frequencies and momenta, then uh, for this specific case, okay, again, you're gonna have a non-constant factor, non-trivial behavior, non-analytic behavior and momenta. You still have the momentum conserving part, and then uh, you have uh, this, this factor over here. So again, this is more complicated than this one. Uh, actually, we spent quite a lot of time to try to understand um, how is it possible to have something so simple here that becomes hard to kind of reproduce that. And we do describe that in the paper. It's, it's a bit technical, so I'm not gonna describe it here. But the idea is, so over here, we basically expand, we do uh, expand in plane waves. Now, when you go to this description, you keep the K dependence the same, but we want to trade this behavior here for the Bessel functions. And there is a way to write this in terms of Bessel functions. And when you do this, that precisely reproduces this factor starting from here. And the same result holds for general delta ND. Uh, this should have, well, I mean, I have this in my outlook, but uh, it, 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 it's very intriguing that one lands into this kind of very simple representation of correlators should have a deeper meaning. Term. Okay, so this was the holographic results. So now let's try to get a feeling how much of this is, strong coupling, and how much of this is just a specific type of model we discuss, and how much of that you can, can recover by doing a toy model. So this toy model would be three fermions in the sitter. So what we did is we deformed the CFT with an operator of dimension two. So let's think of an explicit model, and there is an explicit model. You can just start with and equals three. So in, actually in all dimensions, if you have massless fermions, that's a CFT. So that's the CFT we start from. And we want something of dimension two and in D equals three and the mass term, the operator psi, psi, psi bar psi is as dimension two. So a theory that models, the quantum field theory we would discuss is just a free massive fermion in the sitter. So it has, Suddenly, the general setup, the setup is the same. Of course, uh, this is a free theory. So, I'm saying you take the theory to strong coupling is a bit of a misnomer, but nevertheless, has some of the features. Uh, at least in the beginning, I thought, uh, you know, we'll open some old paper discussing massive fermions in the sitter, but somehow, at least I, we couldn't find them. So, it's, uh, it, uh, this doesn't seem to appear in the literature, even in that rather simple system. Uh, so we ended up computing some of that using, uh, using formal perturbation theory. So you can view the mass as a perturbation like what we did in the bulk. 
And then uh, compute using conformal perturbation theory in Minkowski space with a singular source for the mass, like I discussed earlier. Uh, now in, uh, in free fermion CFT, of course, the expectation values on the CFT are zero. The two point function is fixed. And in this case, uh, with, with canonical normalization, one gets this value of normalization. Now it turns out for uh, the free fermion CFT, the three point function is zero. That's special to the free fermion theory. <clears throat> and uh, it's a little bit tedious, but uh, straightforward to compute also the four point function, which we have also computed and uh, it's, it's non zero. So now these are the data that will go in into the conformal perturbation theory. So let's first start with one point functions. So we start with the one point function. Again, the CFT gives zero. Then we have the deformation. So we bring down the operator O, and there is another one here. This two point function we know, we put it in, we do the integral, and this is the answer. Then uh, this was the one point function in Minkowski with a singular source. We want the answer in the sitter. So we need to do the ball transformation with to, to go back to the sitter, and that's the answer. And that's precisely the answer we had earlier. So that kind of confirms. Now, one should contrast this with the discussion I started the talk. So I started the talk saying you have weakly coupled on field theories. This have infrared divergences. And the first instance of that was the computation of the value of phi squared in the seat of four in lambda to the fourth theory. I think first was done back in 78 by Bunch and Davis. It was recomputed several times through the years. Uh, I think the uh, uh, Starobinsky Yokoyama computation 94 is also uh, famous using stochastic quantization. In that case, the answer is given by h squared over m squared. You can see it's dimension two. And that's four and then a two, that's the behavior. But you can see from here that uh, this goes to infinity as much go to zero. That's the origin of the infrared divergences. We here, we see that uh, we have something which smoothly goes to zero. Uh, <clears throat> so the system we're considering soundly behaves better than kind of the, 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 the the lambda to the fourth theory people consider in the literature. And now if you go to two point functions, again, you can use conformal perturbation theory. So the linear order would be the CFT result. Then we have the three point function when we bring one factor of M from uh, when we do conformal perturbation theory, then we have two factors of M and a four point function. Now, in this case, we as I just give you for this specific theory, this is zero. And therefore, the answer is the answer of the CFT plus corrections of order m squared, which is exactly what we get. So in the, in the holographic results, we also have no order and contribution in the, in the computation. Now, these terms over here are also kind of similar to the terms we had in the bulk, but we have not managed to fully compute this integral. So we know this result, but we haven't managed to fully do that integral. So that's another interesting thing to further explore. So again, some of the features that we saw are also reproduced in this toy model. Okay, so any questions about the toy model before I conclude? So. So what about the structure of the two point uh, in the K space that you mentioned before? Can you use? So the, 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 the structure is exactly the same. So the two point functions that we extracted. Yeah, I was asking about the dependence in K that you were intrigued about. Okay. That's uh, of course the same because I can uh, do this. This ah, yeah. if the computation, I can uh, yeah, write yeah, it yeah. in yeah, the sorry. best of places. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah I see. Sorry, thanks. Okay, so now let me briefly conclude. So what I discussed today is how to 
study strongly coupled quantum field theories in the CETA3 via holography. We saw no signs of infrared instabilities. But perhaps this is unsurprising, given that the Q quantum field theory we consider was the formation of uh, CFT. So that's in contrast with the, uh, with the phi to the fourth theory, lambda phi to the fourth theory in four dimensions, where the model is not a proper CFT. And I think it's probably more reflects the fact that the theory doesn't have, I mean, the theory is, is, is meant to be uh, um, non-perturbatively, lambda has to go to zero in four dimensions in, in, in flat space. So it's, it's probably related to the, the theory people studied rather than um, instabilities of the sitter. So it, 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 it is likely that if you, one repeats the, the same analysis that people have done through the years, but looking for theories which are the formations of, 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 uh, of CFTs, maybe the infrared, the infrared infinities go away. Um, the other thing we have seen is that uh, the answer is expressed as a spectral representation with sum over a simple pulse, which is very suggestive. And this pulse were precisely the normalizable modes of the space time. Uh, and we, we saw that perturbatively, uh, but I, I believe it also be true non perturbatively. So, outlook uh, okay, the CT3 is, of course, very interesting uh, because we're able to do everything. But if you want to model our own, uh, if we want to use this for our own universe, okay, we have to be in four dimensions. So, uh, it would be interesting to extend to the CT4, and this is something that we're currently doing. But now if one uh, thinks in terms of early universe cosmology, it would be more interesting to do it for FRW. And uh, I think it's possible that's also something we're discussing doing. Um, and uh, we did the analysis for a very specific bulk model where the scalar field was just essentially very massive scalar field. Uh, but one can suddenly set up the whole thing for a general potential. That's also something we, we have done. Now, the next question is once you set it up, whether the questions are solvable. And uh, so that, that's where uh, it becomes more tricky. And once in a sense, this are worked out, then it would be interesting to try to connect with the questions we started from. So if it is from early universe cosmology, it would be interesting to try to connect with cosmological observables. Uh, if it is for, uh, for, the, for the current period, again, you can try to see what you can say about uh, quantum fields in the presence of a cosmological constant as we move to, uh, as we move in the future where space-time would approach the sitter. And uh, finally, uh, I said it earlier, I mean, this Bessel basis is extremely simple and it would be interesting to kind of explore it more, understand whether it can say novel things about CFTs or simplify computations and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Costas. <laughs> very nice talk. Now, we, well, we have some questions, but hopefully we'll have more now. So. Sir, can I? Oh. Yes, yes, please go on. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, show the video. So I want to make a couple comments. Uh, so uh, the first uh, the first one, there is already the literature example uh, where the um, boundary is DS4. And in particular, there is a very rich structure of different phases uh, of um, you know, different vacuum phases of the series. So this is like, um, I think about 100 page papers that I wrote of cascading gauge theory in this sitter. So that's that's exactly sort of the, uh, the vacuum structure uh, that you are discussing that, that you you have- probably Alex, that would be more complicated, right? It would be a lot more- Yeah, 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 but I'm saying it's done. It's done. Yes. It's 2019 paper and it's done and uh, uh, right, so it's it's really an extension of you know the uh, 3D model uh, which was two two years earlier. Another comment I want to make is uh, that um, so, sorry, it's a kind of maybe a little bit of the advertisement. 
so but but it is i think it's relevant so how much the the idea of uh, uh sort of this quasi normal mode can be extended uh in, in this setting right so uh, which, alex which, i don't think this has anything to do with quasi normal modes this is just well, more yeah, yeah, yeah yeah the polls i call it quasi normal mode but you know it's uh, it's just a matter of language right so the poles of your correlation functions right mm -hmm. so so there will be a soon paper that I will put out, uh, which will have a general framework, sort of a master field formalism, a uh, very simple one for arbitrary series in arbitrary dimensions with arbitrary potentials. And, and it would have this flavor sort of uh, kind of similar flavor to what we are familiar with quasi normal modes in the black hole backgrounds. Where, where you can reduce all the spectrum of fluctuations uh, into basically a couple, um, uh, a couple gauge invariant modes. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's important because it allows you when there are different phases with this at the boundary, it allows you to study stability of these phases. So, so I'm saying that it looks daunting, but uh, you know, as you were saying initially, you know, the scalar perturbation looks very horrible. But if you do the right way, if you set up the problem correctly, it can be solved in full general. Of course, I agree with you that computing uh, computing residues would be awesome, you know, uh, uh, and 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 also uh, incredibly important with profound implications is really the m m goes to infinity limit. So that's that's super interesting how those series are done, and. I also tried and failed to get get those asymptotics uh, analytically. So if you guys could do it, that would be really, really great. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's all very interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward uh, to the paper. Let me also ask a question concerning your one point function and in particular about this limit m going to infinity or m over h going to infinity. And this uh, constant minus zero point three seven. Yeah. So, so this was for delta being two. How does it change with delta? If you change that, I think we have only yeah. delta equals two. <laughs> uh, um, okay. And is it clear clear why it should be negative? No, it's not clear why it should be negative. Um, at least not to me. Maybe then or uh, for second comment if they have a comment. So. Uh, uh, that's here, yes. Yeah, that's. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, that, that's another interesting question. Of course, you know, that relates to the um, yeah, positivity properties of the operator. If the operator is positive, I mean, that suggests the operator is negative definite in this case. So. But that's strange or not? I mean, at this point, of course, uh, this generality would not know uh, what is this operator, right? It's just an, op an operator scaling dimension two. So you also don't know. So so also this this perturbative analysis M was also only done for delta being two, or right? because it. Yes. During your talk, at one point, you said you we have also results for general values of d and delta and so on. But I think this was uh, uh, this was for the uh, uh, what is general is this this the CFT part. This has an extension for general delta d, and then the setup has an extension for delta d, but my one needs to be able to solve the equation. Hmm. And that uh, it's in the case. So. Okay, good, thanks. Any other question? As usual, after we start top the recording, I'll ask again if people has more informal questions. <laughs> but uh, let's give another last chance for on the record questions. 
Okay, if not, um, let's first thank Costas again for this very nice talk. And then let me uh, place you to the to the next season of Hollywood, hopefully starting October. And with with that, I will stop this session. Five.